And if you look at the outline, you can see how they're connected. Plus, I've always run a, wanted to write a title for a sermon that had all the same letters. Potter, priest, prophet. Well, I thought I was just so clever. Now that I see it, I'm going, huh, you better live up to that. What we're going to see again, as we saw last week, is a paradox of the sovereignty of God and the free will of mankind. The other reason I wanted to do three chapters, not be just because they fit together in this history that Jeremiah has put together, it gives us a chance to pause and consider a panoramic view of the history of mankind from God's perspective, perhaps? In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Created a perfect garden, put in two perfect people to take care of that garden and to eat whatever they wanted except one tree, which, like you and I, <laughs> they couldn't resist. They went and ate and messed everything up. Almost immediately, God made a prophetic statement to the serpent, proclaiming that in the future, a seed of a woman would bruise his head, would destroy him. Before God created heaven and earth, he knew that we were going to mess up, and he, would knew, he knew that he was going to come in and rescue us, save us. So he set into motion a plan of redemption that involved this boy to be born of a virgin, which meant he needed to show the world who that young woman was going to be, Mary, and that she needed to be of a certain tribe of people, the Hebrews, which means she needed to be born a descendant of Judah, which meant there needed to be a Jacob, which meaning there an Isaac, an Abraham, a Noah. Do you see how it unfolds when you look at the Bible from beginning to end? God knew, knows, and is knowing exactly what he's doing. He did not get nervous, start biting his nails. <laughs> when Adam and Eve did what they did, nor what you did this morning getting ready for church. Marcia and I once in a while joke about what it was like when we were raising young kids trying to get ready to go worship the Lord. I told you to get... No, the other outfit was fine. Put those clothes back on. Remember those days? You get one dress and the other one's undressed. And God knows that. He is so concerned about his people and this plan, this redemptive plan. This is why Jeremiah is being sent to, to Jerusalem, to the providence of Judah, to give these messages. All the prophets were going to these various places to get God's people to enjoy the privileges of the blessings that were theirs, and all they needed to do was just obey what he said. That's all they needed to do. Well, that's all Adam and Eve needed to do. However, which tells me one thing that I still have hope for, nobody leaves this planet without multiple opportunities to hear the gospel. You notice how many times Jeremiah is sent and the other prophets to basically give the same message. If you will turn around, then I will do this. But if you don't, judgment is coming. Well, they won't turn around. In these three chapters, we're going to meet Jeremiah doing something that hasn't been done yet in Scripture. He's going to go 
to a potter's workshop. So if you'll open your Bible to chapter 18. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, verse 1, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up or pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent from the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. In the instant I speak to a nation concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I would benefit it. Therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster devising a plan against you. Return now every one from his evil way, and I will make your ways doing good. There it is. If then. Notice the very next line. Notice their reaction to the prophet's sermon about the potter. And how he's reflecting on the sovereignty of God to do with a nation what a potter does with clay. To start all over again, if he chooses. I wonder sometimes in my naivety, how many times God thought about, you know what? This Hebrew people aren't working out so good. I think I'll chuck it, get a new piece of clay, and start all over again. I wonder if you thought that about Adam. You know, he's dirt. I got lots of that. I'll just go make me a version 2.0. We'll try it again. He didn't do that, hasn't done it, and apparently is not planning to do that. Is that enough time to go back to your Bible, verse 12? And they said, that is hopeless. So we will walk according to our own plans and we will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart. Do you hear the mockery there? You dare, Prophet Jeremiah, tell us that we're evil? We just listen to you go on and on and on about how bad we are. Chapter 17. Why don't you just be quiet, go home, and leave us alone? And we will do what's right to us in our evil heart. Mockery. That is a heart turning extremely hard towards God. So the Lord said, verse 13, As now among the Gentiles have heard such a thing, even those pagans out there don't talk like that. So this contrast is going on between prophet Jeremiah and the people of Judah. But the thing I want you to notice here in chapter 18, the imagery of the potter and the other places that I'm going to reference in Scripture always have to do with a nation, not an individual. Isaiah 29, verse 16, speaking of Israel, the Lord said, quote, For shall the thing made say to him who made it, he did not make me? Nor shall the thing formed say to him who formed it, he has no understanding? Again, Isaiah 41, speaking of Israel, I have raised up one from the north, and he shall come 
from the rising of the sun, he shall call on my name, and he shall come against the princes as though mortar, and the potter treads clay. Isaiah 68, again, referencing Israel as clay in the potter's hand. Twice in this chapter, Jeremiah is going to do the same thing here and the next chapter. Jeremiah is going to do it again in Lamentations 4.1. Speaking of Israel, Jeremiah says on behalf of the Lord, the precious sons of Zion, valuable as fine gold, how they are regarded as clay pots, work in the potter's hand. Zechariah, same thing. Paul picks up the same theme and uses the imagery of clay in the hands of a potter to say to the Hebrew people whom he is desperately trying to get to accept Jesus as Messiah, who has now opened the door to the Gentiles to convince them that God can do what he wants. He can open the door to salvation to the Gentile if it pleases him, just as it pleases a potter to make what he wants out of clay. Always a nation. Therefore, I think it's inconsistent with Scripture to lift from the Bible God's use of the potter and clay to suggest that his sovereign right remains his to choose one person for salvation and choose another for destruction. Is God sovereign? Absolutely. But I think it's unfair to biblical interpretation to lift the potter and the clay out of context and make it fit that conclusion. It has to do with a nation, not individuals. To make his point even further, chapter 19, Jeremiah is asked to go back to a potter and do something else. Chapter 19, verse 1 reads, Thus says the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen flask, and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry to the Potsherd Gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. And say, quote, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place, and whoever hears it the ears will tingle because they have forsaken me and have made this an alien place because they have burnt incense in it to other gods whom they neither known their fathers or the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. They have built in the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it even come to my mind. Did you just read what I read? Did you just hear what Jeremiah is commanded to tell these evil people? I want you to go get a flask from the potter. And I want you to break it in this valley. Because this is the valley where you have offered up your children as a burnt sacrifice to Baal. You have built an evil idol to Baal, Moloch, in the form of a bull and you have heated it up with fire and you have laid your sons on it as a sacrifice to this God you have invented. Shatter this flask in this evil valley. And we wonder about the patience and long-suffering of God Almighty. Jeremiah is asked by God to remind them, the people of Judah, who he is. Yahweh of hosts, Lord God Almighty. 
I love you so, and you need to stop what you're doing. They didn't stop, nor have we, even today, offer up children as a sacrifice to a false god. Now, I need to roll this over into the New Testament for a bit to make another point. This same valley is mentioned in the New Testament, but there the valley of the son of Hinnom is shortened to one word, Gehenna. Just one word, Gehenna. An unfortunate thing has happened in our translations. This word, Gehenna, which refers to this valley in the book of Jeremiah, is interpreted hell in most of our Bibles. Take the word Gehenna, which is this place, and make it the word hell in the New Testament. What's unfortunate is this. The concept of hell becomes this burning place of torture, garbage, the leftover carcasses of animals, a continuing, smoldering, putrid place, a dump. That concept now has been singed in the mind of Western people as hell. That's where we throw people who don't agree with us. No. That's where God pushes people he doesn't like. No, I've read Dante's Inferno. That's where people are dumped so they'll be tortured for eternity, prodded, all manners of evil. So you take Dante's Inferno, which is based uh, loosely off of Greek mythology, mix it in with this Gehenna smoldering dump, and that's hell? No, it is not hell as described in the New Testament as the in eternal place of residence for those who reject the mercy of God. In the New Testament, hell is described as what? A lake of fire, a lake of fire so torturous it's pitch black darkness, a bottomless pit. My question to you is, is that hell? It's what the scripture says hell is. Could hell even be worse than that? Could those just be imageries that God has put in the minds of John the Revealer? And Jesus talks about to the people of his generation, repent or perish. Because if you don't, it's like being thrown into a bottomless lake of fire where it's pitch dark black and you fall forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. My question for us this morning is, could hell be even worse than that? The reason I ask that question for you to ponder is, most people reject any concept of hell whatsoever. When you die, you die. There is no life after death. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no eternal punishment for those who reject Jesus Christ as Messiah, as the Redeemer. There is no such thing. Because in their mind, God the Father cannot do such a thing. When he is lambasting the people of Judah for burning live babies on a scorching hot rock, how can he throw a living person into a lake of fire? I don't accept it. Well, here's the truth of the matter. It doesn't matter what you accept. 
You cannot believe in hell, it still exists. You cannot believe in heaven, it still exists. You cannot believe in God, he still exists. What we, let me put it this way, God does not exist because we believe him to exist. That make sense? God will not cease being God if we take a vote and 51% of the people say, nah, I'll just do what I want in my evil mind. You hear what society is saying now? Because we reject hell, we reject heaven. Because we reject both of those, we reject God. We don't want to hear about it. Maybe that is hell. You say to God, just please leave me alone. And he does. Forever and ever and ever and ever. You are alone. Perfectly. Totally. Absolutely in pitch black darkness by yourself. Meanwhile, in heaven, <laughs> somebody drew a cartoon once about the difference between heaven and hell. In both places, you have people whose arms are locked. And in hell, they're trying to feed themselves. throwing food all over everybody in the room. And in heaven, we're feeding each other. Hmm. Could you put some cheese on that apple pie? <laughs> I don't think it's either of those. What I think is, in hell, perhaps, totally alone. Always being reminded, oops, did I mess up? Meanwhile, in heaven, what I'm trying to say is this valley that Jeremiah is asked to remind the people of Judah how horrible it is becomes a burning place of refuge in the New Testament and then twisted somehow into a misconception of what hell really is. What Jeremiah is being asked to do by these two references to a potter is this. Like a potter, God can mold a nation into whatever he wants it to be. And he has molded Israel to be a kingdom on this planet for as long as there is an old earth. And this kingdom of Hebrews will bring forth Messiah. This was the plan, and it hasn't changed. We just sang a song mentioning the third day. A week from today, we will celebrate communion where we will remind ourselves of what he really did. He, our friend Jesus, took the punishment of sin, death, upon himself so that we won't have to. For the wages of sin is death. He took it. He took it at a time in human history where there was an army on this planet that relished in human pain. Soldiers who took delight in whipping men filleting the flesh right off of their bones. Isaiah said of the crucified Messiah, unrecognizable, no movie, even the passion has ever come close to depicting what Jesus probably looked like after they got through 
with him. And then they had the cruelty of the crown and thorns and to put the robe on and rip it off and present him to two faithful men who would put him in a tomb. And then in their silly, legalistic hearts, they seal the rock. Because they heard a rumor that his disciples might come in and take the body and then proclaim him risen from the dead. So we'll put guards. <laughs> Don't you, I just love this. Now this would make a great movie. We'll put guards in front of their stone and we will threaten them with death if the guy behind that rock gets taken. Can you imagine what it was like when the stone just started rolling away all by its lonesome? And Jesus steps out. Because the Bible said he would. So astonished were they when they got there. Angels had to say to them, Come see, go tell. Come see that he's not here, now go tell. That message still goes on today. Come see what God has done, now go tell others what you have witnessed. This is why our prayer chain and our times on our knees with the Lord God Almighty is so crucial even today. We need to pray and keep praying for members of our church family by name and in general for what is going on. We need to thank God for what he has done and ask him to continue until it is finished. I'll give you two examples. A few weeks ago, Joanne stood right there and thanked you for praying for her, the miracle God had done. She's still recuperating. We still need to lift Joanne up in prayer. Tuesday, we prayed for Bubba Sr., doing better, but still. Can you feel what I'm trying to say? Until we all get to heaven, we need to wear calluses on our knees and pray that the people that we earnestly want to turn to Jesus do so before it's too late. They may not acknowledge there is a hell, but there is eternity without God, and we don't want them to suffer that. Which brings us to chapter 20. The religious leaders of Jeremiah's day didn't like him saying what he said in the slightest. Now, Pashur, the son of Emir, the priest who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Well, it's about time you heard. So what does he do? Verse 2. Then Pashur struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. The Bible is being very polite here. Struck literally means beat. He didn't walk up to Jeremiah and give him the backhand. He whomped on him. Stocks in Hebrew means twisted. It was a device designed to contort the human body in such a way that in a, just a few minutes, the person in the stock was in excruciating pain. And it happened the next day, verse 3. So Jeremiah was left there all day, all night. 
when he would have been in absolute total pain in just a few minutes. Brought Jeremiah out of the stock. Then Jeremiah said to him, The Lord has not called your name Pashur, but Magor Misabib. Look that up. Jeremiah was being kind. If you translate that in your reference, you'll see that Hebrew name means fear on every side. In other words, Jeremiah is saying to this priest, I'm not afraid of you, but fear is going to surround you. Verse 4, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all of its produce, all of its precious things, all of its treasures of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hand of their enemies who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die and be buried there. And all uh, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies, you're going to hell. You're going to be punished. Not for what you did to me. I didn't read it that way. But what you have done to the people of God. You have lied to God's chosen people. That he set apart to bring forth Messiah. And you will pay for this. So we have in this imagery here the idea that God is sovereign He can raise up Judah to bring forth this blessing which he promised Abraham and still will keep that promise. He brought forth Messiah who would hang on the cross to pay the awful penalty of our sinfulness, all of our sins. And like a potter, he can do what he wills with a a, people with a nation raise up Babylon to do this thing send his chosen people the Hebrew people to Babylon for 70 years to pay for their sin and bring them back rebuild the temple why because he made a promise to Abraham that the Messiah would bless all the nations and he will punish those who rob children of their destiny, of their life. They will pay. So what I want to conclude here for you this morning is simply this. I have friends, and I think you do too, who deny there is a hell. They're still wrestling whether there's a God or not. Well, pretty soon it's going to be past too late to make up your mind. It'd be like us taking a vote whether or what time we want the sun to come up tomorrow. <laughs> Let's see, it's Monday, I want to sleep in. How about 10 a.m.? What do you say? All in favor? <laughs> Sun's going to come up when it comes up. I don't know about you, but we joke around our house that we should have been weathermen on TV. You can be partially right and make 100K a year. (laughs) What time will the sun come up tomorrow? Dawn. (laughs) What time will it go down? Sunset. (laughs) What's the weather like? Partly cloudy. No rain in sight. You could do that from your bed. You know what? I'm getting carried away. Little has changed in human nature since the days of Jeremiah. Very little has changed. We still have 
religious leaders who can't make up their mind if they want to serve their own pocketbook or serve the Lord God Almighty. Two days ago, I got an email from YouTube regarding our site there, CVBCAZ, where you can view this if you choose to. They wanted to remind us of their community guidelines, which are defined as follows, quote, hate speech is not allowed on YouTube. We remove content, pr content promoting violence or hatred against individuals or groups based on any of the following attributes, age, caste, disability, ethnicity, gender identity, expression, nationality, race, immigration status, religion, sex, gender, sexual orientation, victims of a major violent event of their kin, or veteran status. Then in all bold letters, Underlined, they sent me this warning or this invitation, however you want to view it. Quote, if you find content that violates this policy, report it. In other words, if anybody is revolted by, offended by anything they see on this YouTube, they can call up or send an email to YouTube and we get a strike against them. And another second. When we get the third one, then YouTube's going to decide whether they leave us on their channel or not. I almost said the air. but So what they're doing is they're saying to the viewers of YouTube, you're in control of what you want to see and hear. If you're offended by it, then it's hate speech. Now, I'm going to take it up a notch because I got an email from Dale this week also that pointed out an article where in Finland a pastor of a church has been arrested for a hate crime. You know what he did that was so hateful that incited violence? He read scripture from the pulpit. He read from the book of Romans where God talks about homosexuality without mentioning the word homosexual because the word didn't exist when Paul wrote Romans. But it's pretty obvious who God is writing about. So had Paul been on YouTube, gone. But less comical is the fact that this pastor who's been a pastor for decades is now under arrest because he had the audacity to tweet a scripture from the Holy Word of God. He's being charged with violating, quote, legal preferences for government privilege identity groups. So I read that again. He's being charged for inciting hatred, violating legal preferences for government privileged identity groups. So if a government identifies you as privileged and somebody dare quote scripture and you're offended by that, you're under arrest for inciting hatred. I find it strange that in a nation north of us, a man who wants to identify as a woman can legally demand to be treated as a lesbian. Do you follow that? So a man wants to identify as a woman who's a lesbian, a man who claims to be a woman who prefers women is legally protected. But I can't quote Romans chapter 1. I conclude with this statement. People are still saying, this is hopeless. We will walk according to our plans and we will obey the dictates of our evil heart. Uh, uh, uh. We'll do what we want. Meanwhile, God in his kindness is saying, 
You don't want to do that. We'll do what we wish. You're going to live to regret it. Leave me alone. I love you too much. Stop talking to me. No. Because eventually they will find out the awful truth that God knew exactly what he was talking about. Those who reject him will for eternally be left alone without God. So, as you walk out this morning, enjoy your freedom in Christ.